two cousins, it's me, Rusty. I'm here on the Rusty the Reseller YouTube channel. And folks, today we have a very packed video. This is all about being a reseller. These are the things, the tips, advice, whatever you want to call it, hot tips that I wish I was given before I became a full-time reseller. Some of you out there have been considering reselling, haven't pulled the trigger yet. Some of you are doing it part-time and think maybe I should do this full-time. Folks, this is the information that I wish someone had told me ahead of time. I had to figure this out on my own. And uh, this is the, exactly the type of video I want on my channel is the type that can really help you out, give you information just like other YouTubers gave me early on in my, you know, journey in this uh, reselling world that helped me. Uh, so here we go, folks. I'm going to give you lots of tips. This is the things that you should know and consider uh, before you start being a reseller and things that you will likely experience once you get started. How long should you do reselling part-time before you jump into doing it full-time. Well, my advice to you would be do it for an entire year. Uh, it doesn't necessarily matter when you start as long as you do it for a full year. And here's why. Just like retail sales out in the world and just about any type of retail sales, there are ups and downs. There's differences based on the time of year as far as how much is going to sell, what's going to sell, that sort of thing. And it's good for you to dip your toes in that part-time to experience and learn about that before you go all in. So here's the teaser. Certain months, like the beginning of the year, um, February... Um, is like usually a low month, um, kind of right before fourth quarter. Uh, so we're like around September a lot of times is lower because of what's happening. Um, people uh, spend a lot of money getting people back into school at the end of summer. They're trying to not spend money anymore. And so September's low. Then it amps back up again because certain people are starting to buy stuff for Christmas later in the year. January, they still buy because they got money for Christmas. But then in February, they're like, whoa, whoa, I got to... I got to slow down here. And so then the sales drop. Okay. It just has to do with people's lives. And so you need to learn that and you need to learn how to plan uh, financially around that sort of thing. When to save the money, when to spend the money. Also, you'll learn that there are sourcing opportunities that are different based on the time of the year as well. Certain months uh, tend to have better things or for better prices. So I would say spend a year, get familiar with the course of a year, the ups and downs, the certain months, so that you can kind of build a really smart plan for yourself once you decide to slip in full time. How much money should I have if I'm going to be doing reselling? You know, to cover expenses, to buy my items, that sort of thing. It's a great question. I did not have the luxury of doing what I'm about to tell you because my story sort of necessitated me jumping in without a lot of capital, or a lot of lot, without a lot of time to plan. But I would say if you want to do reselling full time, you should save between three, and that's a minimum, three months and six months worth of the, whatever your life costs, whatever all your expenses of normal life are. Um, add that up. And however much, you know, between three and six months worth of that. Here's my main reasoning. Number one, if you can, if you can work part time at reselling and save enough money, uh, so that you don't have to take out any sort of business loan or something and you don't have to start off in debt to anybody else, you're going to be in a much better position. So I would say do a year of part time, uh, reselling, save that money, and then you'll be in a really good spot. Second of all, you want to have that much money because uh, depending on when you start out, it's difficult. There's a large learning curve in the beginning. You're going to make some mistakes financially. You're going to buy some things that don't sell quickly, don't sell for much. It, you might even lose money on some stuff because you're it's new, right? Um, so you want to be able to compensate yourself and kind of pad yourself for that. Also, things can uh, be varied widely in what sales and how much money you make from month to month. One month as a full-time reseller, you could make as little as a thousand, couple thousand dollars. You could make as much as ten, fifteen thousand dollars, dependent. And so, uh, meanwhile, your costs in life are not always fixed, but you generally know that each month that comes, you're going to have certain costs. If you have a car payment, that's going to be there. If you have mortgage or rent, that's going to be there. And you need to have money to cover that because full-time means 
this is how you're making your living. So you want to have that money saved back because if it comes to February or whatever that month is for you that's a really low month, you need to make sure you have money in reserve to pay things that uh, you're going to have to spend either way. Another thing you need to consider is that if you're selling online uh, on platforms such as eBay or Etsy, there is a lag between the time that you list an item, it sells, and the money gets to you. What do I mean by that? Well, people who are not selling online on eBay, for example, may not realize that when you sell an item, there is a certain amount of days between when a person is required to pay you and when eBay puts that money in your account. So for example, if you're selling an item that is um, on an auction, and when that auction ends, depending on if you did it for a three day, five day, seven, 10 day auction, you've got that time to consider. So if I wanna put up something today at a seven day auction, well, it's not gonna sell, if it sells, it's not gonna sell for seven days, there's a week. Once it sells, since it's an auction, people are not required to pay immediately. So they could still wait four, five days before they pay you. Okay, now we're at 11 or 12 days since the moment you listed that item. If it sells on a Monday or Tuesday, you'll probably get that money by, say, Friday. But if you sell that puppy on a Wednesday or a Thursday or a Friday or a Saturday, that money's not going to come to you because the eBay doesn't pay you out for a good three days from when the money is actually paid uh, for the item, if it happens in the middle of the week, it's like business days, right? So if you sell on like a Thursday uh, or a, a Wednesday, let's say Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they might give you an email saying, we sent your payment, but that money's not coming to your account until Tuesday. <laughs> so I sold some stuff. Um, today um, is Tuesday. I got paid out this morning for an item that I sold last Wednesday. OK, so almost a week. So from the moment you list something on a seven day auction to the moment you get paid could be as much as nearly two weeks away. Right. On top of that, if you have um, an eBay store, they encourage you to give a 30 day a 30 day return window. So if it takes me two weeks to sell something and get paid for it, I still have another 30 days of time before that, uh, I'm in the clear, meaning I could sell something, and then 29 days later, that person, that buyer say, hey, just didn't match description. I'm not happy with it. I didn't feel like you described it correctly or whatever it is, and you're required to refund that money. And so imagine if you have a high-dollar item, or maybe you sell a couple of high-dollar items, four, five, six thousand $6,000 items on eBay, and you got $12,000 in your account, that's great that you have it, but in 29 days, a month later, you might have to put twelve, pull that $12,000 back and out and send it right back to that buyer. This is a reality, folks. I love when I can sell high-dollar items and make good money, but that money is not technically able to be used by me until the end of that 30-day because I don't want to be in a position where I spend this money, say on bills, for example, my mortgage or my car payment or something, and then they say, whoops, I want that money back. And then me be like, well, sorry, I don't have it. That You'd be in big trouble if you did that. So you need to know how this stuff works. You need to understand uh, how long it takes for auctions or buy it now things to end. You need to know what day of the week it'll end on so you'll know generally when the money will come to you. And you need to know how long you have to hold on to it before you can use it and don't risk having to send it back. <laughs> It should go without saying, folks, that because of that timeline or those timelines I discussed, it's important to have a strategy as far as when you list items. So if you're doing a seven-day auction, when are the best days and times for that auction to end? You need to look out seven days in the future at the time that you list it. I'll tell you from my personal experience that things tend to sell better um, and for higher amounts on the weekends and the evenings. So Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, or in the middle of the day on Saturday or Sunday. Why is that, Rusty? Well, common sense to tell you that 
people are usually off work on the weekends. They're on their phones. They're on the computers looking for stuff. They got the time to be looking. So if you have an auction that's ending, you don't want that thing to be ending at 2 a.m. on a Tuesday because there are not very many people watching that listen at 2 a.m. unless it's really important, a really valuable item. But if you've just got something that's $20 or $30 item, you're, uh, you want to have that thing listed at certain times so that they'll end at the optimal time for a buyer to buy that item. eBay is constantly changing things. Uh, their algorithm changes when they're going to put your stuff in front of somebody else. They're requiring a lot of times for you to pay extra money now when you're listing something in order to maximize the number of people who see it. One of the tricks that you should know about is the trick of ending your items out of your store, not relisting them, but clicking the button that says sell similar item. And what this does, folks, well, first of all, let me say, if you list something in your store and it sits up there for a month, two months, every day that that's up there, somebody else is listing something in that same category and it's coming in the new part of the feed. So if I say, um, I don't know, let's look at this right here. Let's say that I'm looking for impressionistic oil paintings from the 1800s. Okay, so let's say you have a, this beauty right here that you want to sell. This woman in pink. I love this painting. So let's say that you've listed this sucker up there for a certain price. And it sits up there for 30 days. So during that time, someone else, they listed this painting. And they listed this painting. And they listed this one right down here. And these. All these paintings are coming up in the same category. And someone like myself, who is following oil paintings, I have new items to look at every day. Am I looking at your item anymore? No, I'm looking at the new ones of the day. I might have saved yours, but every day that passes, I've kind of forgotten about it. And that particular listing of this painting that you made has a particular item number assigned to it. If you end that item and relist that item, this item's going back up in your store, but it's still attached to that original item number that you put it up with in the first place. So what I like to do every few days is I will take down completely that item, and then I will click Sell Similar. And what it does in eBay is it copies that exact listing, word for word, the price, everything, but it assigns it a new eBay number. Now, when you pop this puppy up, it goes into the fresh feed. So myself and anybody else who's looking for these paintings are going to see it again. And just by doing that, folks, regularly, I don't even change the price, but just by doing that regularly, I promote um, more sales more often simply because I'm putting this item in front of people's faces um, more often than just once. <laughs> If you want to be a full-time reseller, folks, you have to know and have a really good strategy of where you're going to be getting your items to sell. When I started off, because it was uh, sort of, I sort of fell into it, uh, I lost a job, and I was at home helping Flo out with her, her children, and I needed to help uh, help provide for family life, put food on the table, pay our bills, but also be helping out. And so that was a really difficult time. A lot of people experienced a difficult time when COVID uh, came on the scene. Um, and else people were just trying to be uh, careful of themselves and, and respectful of other people and trying to keep their distances. And so how do you make money if you can't be out and about doing your regular job? That's how I got into it. But for you, if you're if you're interested and you're trying to learn, and you're thinking, I want to sell things, but I just where do you even find these deals at, Rusty? Where, where are you finding nice jewelry? And where are you finding these things? I'll tell you exactly where I'm finding them, folks. And you may not have all of these around you, but you'll certainly have some of them. So here's my list. I'm just going to lay it out for you. I go to local thrift stores. Um, you will likely have something like a Goodwill, a Salvation Army, or some sort of thrift store that is oftentimes associated with a nonprofit organization locally in your community. I like to shop at those places because, A, I know that they're getting new product in weekly. Uh, people are donating all the time. Secondarily, I like to shop there because it is in my community, and the proceeds, at least a portion of the proceeds, uh, both employ people in my community and they um, donate some of those proceeds to charities or, or nonprofit organizations in my community. And I 
it is important to me to support my community <laughs> is what I'm getting at here. So I want to do that. Now, do I find my best deals at thrift stores? Usually not. And the reason is research will tell you if you look this up, you can fact check me if you want to. But um, the the percentage of items that are on any given day sitting in a Goodwill, for example, the likelihood that that thing is going to be like like 95 plus percent of the stuff in there, the, the actual value, retail value of that item is like under $30. Okay, so... It's difficult. I mean, you might be able to buy that thing for a buck and sell it for 30. And that's that's a pretty good turnaround. But if that's the only type of item you're getting, you're going to have to sell a pretty high volume of those types of items in order to make the money that you're going to need if you're doing it full time. Now, again, I've got uh, a, a missus and I've got a couple of uh, a little you know, rug rats running around. And so cost of living is a little bit higher than if I was just a single rusty running around, right? So I don't know what your financial situation is. You know what it is. Um, if you think you can get by by doing that, then all you need to do is go into a thrift store. But uh, that is a place that I regularly hit. I have a variety of them in my locale that I hit geographically. Uh, Peaches is the same way. He hits some different ones. But we do that. Um, we're going to go to, uh, secondarily, we're going to go to antique stores. This is the places where, you know, usually there are a variety of booths that certain people are paying for to have their stuff in. And uh, I, I frequent those because I sell antiques and collectibles. That's primarily what I do. And so that that's, that's who has them <laughs> a lot of times. Um, I'll also search uh, on Facebook Marketplace, uh, if you're familiar with that. Uh, I'll comb it, and uh, if it's something that I really want, I'll be willing to buy it and have them ship it to me. But most of the time, I'm looking locally at stuff. So there's uh, there's a place you can go. Um, estate sales. You can look these up on the interwebs and find out ones that are local to you. There are also uh, a lot of estate sales out there that just do online auctions, which means you don't actually have to go to it. You can just look on their website. You can uh, bid and then... You know, you just need to be familiar with the the extra costs if there's additional costs or the cost of shipping. But you can buy stuff right off the internet, turn around and resell. Um, eBay. Now, I ninety five percent of my sales are from eBay, and I also source on eBay. I'll buy things from one person on eBay. I'll turn around and resell it on eBay. Now. Uh, you have to have a strategy for why you think you can make more money with the same item. And we can get into that in a different video, but that's another place. Yard sales. That's a great place. If you're, if it's there during that time of year when there are yard sales, obviously in, in the winter, you're not going to see that as much, um, probably, but, uh, you know, yard sales, community wide sales. Sometimes a community will say, Hey, we're all going to get out in this parking lot, uh, you know, at a, at a, a you know grocery store parking lot or something, and we're gonna go and and uh, and everybody can come, and it's ten dollars for a booth or something. Like those are great. I do really well in those. Um, then uh, you know Etsy, places like Etsy, eBay. Um, another thing to do is uh, if you're home. Uh, is just to create something, make something. What Look up what's selling on Etsy. What's a hot item right now? What stuff's popping up uh, recommended to you to buy? You could make something like that. Think about the time of the year. Is it Halloween? Is it Christmas time? Is Easter coming up? What is it? Uh, what are things like? Maybe you start thinking, I'll try to make some ornaments. Pam makes some ornaments and sell them when it comes up to Christmas time. Hey, you know, Halloween postcards sell really well. Maybe I'll do a little sketch, color it up, make it like a, uh, you know, a, a little set of 10 different Halloween postcards and try to sell those uh, when with Halloween coming up. All of those things can work, folks. Not everyone is creative and even wants to do that kind of thing, but it is an idea. Uh, old Rusty here, I'm working on a painting over here. I'm working on some dry point um, etchings uh, because I like to do um, artwork and some other things as a hobby of mine. And, uh, you know, I don't mind trying to, to build that into the business and make a little extra money that way. So that's something else you can do. That's Rusty how to. If you're going to be a full-time reseller, you're going to have to really think about how to separate your work life from your real life, your home life, your family life. Um, I'm a hard worker, and so I'm working all the time. Uh, 
it's true of any person who works for themselves is that there's no time off um, except for that that you give yourself. There's no paid time off. You don't get um, a 401k. You don't get retirement. You don't get any perks of the job. If you're not working, you're not uh, you're not making money. You're not earning. And so, um, you know, you if you're the kind of person who there are the type of people out there, I guess is what I want to say that could let this job completely take over their lives entirely. And all they're ever thinking about is buying and selling. All they're ever doing is working to buy and sell. You can't hardly go on vacation without stressing out that you're not working. Um, you, uh, and you need to consider what impact this type of work would have on your family if you have a family. Are they going to feel like um, you're 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 tuned out? Are you are they going to feel like you're not putting them first? You're putting the job first. Um, I work sometimes in the evenings. I work sometimes on the weekends. Um, I've even gone out working while I'm on a vacation. I'm, I'm, I'll be honest and say that um, I've I found some great deals on vacation before. Um, and but but everyone needs a break, and everyone needs uh, for for just for their mental health. You need to have. Um, a break from time to time. And so you really should consider um, how you're going to balance your work life and your personal life and how you're going to be able to have a barrier. I think it's good in the beginning to say, you know, by a certain time, I'm not going to do this work anymore, or just be communicating constantly with those who you care about and are around you so that uh, you, there isn't any contention or problems relationally that occur. And people don't talk about this, folks. It's, it's, it's not different than any other startup business, small business. Uh, it is what you make it. And when you work really hard, you're more likely for it to be successful. But that can sometimes come at a sacrifice. Sometimes that comes at a cost. And you need to be prepared to know that that's coming. And hopefully you can make a strategy ahead of time so that it doesn't become a burden or a problem for you or the people you care about. If you're going to do this full time, you have to be the type of person who's willing to do the hard work. What do I mean by that? The hard work is not driving to that place and searching for that treasure. That's the fun part. You know, there's pros and there's cons of any job. Well, the big pro is going out and having fun, looking for things that you can sell, finding that treasure. Oh my goodness, I can buy it for this much. This is selling for that much over here. That's the fun part. When you get back here in the warehouse, like I'm you know, in right now, and you see all of this stuff is sitting here. Some of it has been listed. Some of it has yet to be, is yet to be listed. But the sitting there, the research, the, you know, getting there, full days, eight hours, hour days, nine, 10 hour days where you're just in front of a computer and you're just clicking buttons and you're just adding photos to listings. You're creating listings. You're copying listings. You're maintaining your listings. You're delisting. You're relisting. That kind of stuff, guys, it's not for everyone. I'll tell you that right now. It's hard work. And so you need to be prepared to do that. That is the majority of your life as a reseller. It's not this, these other YouTubers and bless their hearts. I have nothing against them, but they're showing you the fun part. And I get it. That's the entertaining part. The walking around, the, the talking with people, the getting the good deal. And I got my GoPro on my chest and, you know, it's, we're having a hoot. It's just fantastic here. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that does happen sometimes, but that's 2% of the time, maybe 5% of the time. Most of the time, folks, is me in the warehouse, me on the computer. I'm listing stuff. So it's not glamorous, guys. I used to work in the in the restaurant and alcohol industry. And, uh, you know, there was a time when, when brewers, craft brewers, there was this romanticism about brewing that beer and uh, and just how exciting it was. And, and, and it is kind of cool. But if you go and stay one day inside of a brew house, you'll learn that 90% of a person's job is cleaning. <laughs> they're cleaning hoses. They're cleaning out tanks. They're getting rid of the, the spent you know, product, the grains. They're putting grain in. They're pitching yeast. They're moving pallets of stuff. It's hard work, folks. And reselling is hard work. It's not glamorous. So if you're getting into this because you're like, oh man, my, 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 my whole life is going to be running around to these outdoor markets and just hooting and hollering and having a great time. What you don't, what you don't see is Oh shoot! I sold this thing for five thousand dollars, and then they want me to—they want a refund now. They want it back. Or, um, you know, you're waiting and waiting, and I thought this thing was going to sell. Man, I shouldn't have bought that thing. What was I thinking? Uh, that kind of stuff, guys. I'm not trying to say don't do this, but I'm trying to say is uh, it's not glamorous. It's not glamorous. You're going to stay in your office 
a lot of the time. You're going to be packaging things up in boxes. Spend a lot of time with tape and boxes. Uh, that's that's the real that's the real life of a reseller. All right, folks. Now it's time for some practical, tangible, specific, concrete um, advice I can give you as far as things that can make your business efficient, whether you're part-time or full-time. These are uh, certain tips, we'll call them my hot tips segment, all right, of things that you can do to help your business um, be a little bit more efficient, all right? Let's, uh, let's uh, Peaches, can you cue that uh, hot tips intro, please? Rusty's Hot Tips. Right here, folks, we have the U.S. PS.com. If you're going to resell full-time, I highly encourage you to come to the U.S. Postal Service website and uh, sign in, make, a, make an account. It is free. There's two reasons why I recommend that you do this. Number one is if you're going to be selling uh, a high uh, a volume of things, there are going to be times when it makes more sense to have the Postal Service come pick up packages from your location rather than you constantly having to make trips to the post office. So if you come over here and you get up here, there's this little spot right here that says schedule a pickup. Okay. If you click on schedule a pickup, it's going to allow you to put in your address. You check availability and the process, it takes literally two minutes. You put in your name, your address, the number of packages that you expect will be needed to be picked up and an approximate weight. You say where at your location, at your front doorstep, at the bottom of the stairs, wherever it is, and they'll come pick it up the next day or whichever day you schedule. It's free, folks, and it will save you a ton of time. Second of all, why the U.S. Postal Service? Well, you know what? If you come up here to shop and you look at shipping supplies right here, boop, you'll find that there are a variety of boxes packaging materials that the U.S. Postal Service will provide you for free. That's right. Now, the only catch, folks, to this is that the stuff that they offer are all priority branded packaging, which means that if you're going to use this box that they're going to give you for free, you're going to end up paying the price to send it priority, which is a higher price than first class, but it will get there faster and there is a little bit of insurance with it. So the question is, do you want to pay pay for boxes, but then less for shipping? Or do you want to pay zero for boxes and a little bit more for shipping? It could come out in the wash at times, but I will tell you to have certain things on hand for free all the time is very, very uh, helpful for your business. Folks, what you're looking at right here is my arsenal of shipping supplies for small items. Small items including postcards, matchbooks, jewelry items, um, things like that usually fit 90% of the stuff that's tiny like this that doesn't need exceptional packaging are what you're looking at right here. This right here is, oh, here we go, it's a six by nine um, bubble mailer. These things cost around 50 some cents. Uh, you can get them less than that if you get them in bulk. Okay, but they're a bubble mailer. These right here are like four by seven, maybe four by six, four and a half by six and a half, something like that. Um, cardboard mailers, they got like a little re like a, a self sealing tab here. All right, all my postcards and matchbooks go into these, and then I purchase rolls of a hundred at a time stamps off of eBay. Uh, stamps forever stamps right now are somewhere like 50, they might have even gone up, they're somewhere between 58. And, and 60 cents, I think, right now. But when I buy these in rolls of 100 at a time, I'll buy 600, maybe even 1,000 sometimes, so 10 rolls. I can get them down to 38 or 39 cents per stamp. What? You can buy stamps on eBay and that's legal and legitimate? 100% yes, folks. So whenever I'm shipping an item, this little mailer costs me like five, well, like 10 cents, I think maybe eight cents, I can't remember. And then my forever stamps cost me like 39 cents. So 49, the, the stamp to get it there in the packaging that it goes in costs me less than buying one forever stamp at the post office at full price. So I can I could send uh, or I could um, sell a postcard, for example, and put $1 shipping on it 
and I'm still going to be less than 50 cents in on shipping it. So I might even make 50 cents on the shipping. <laughs> okay. Or you can, however you want to do it, it doesn't matter. Another thing is if you have something that is less than a quarter of an inch thick, but cannot be bent Meaning these usually, if you just put a stamp on it, these are going to go through a machine, right? And it sort of folds it a little bit, kind of bends it a little bit. That's okay for a postcard. But if you say put, I don't know, like a key fob in here or something, or even a key, let's say, that's thin, but it's it's solid metal. It can't be bent. It'd mess up their machine, right? So what you do is you put, uh, as long as it doesn't weigh too much, you put a stamp on it, and then uh, you put one of these... Um, uh, well, not that, right here, right here. Non-machinable, all right? You do a stamp like this, non-machinable. You can buy these on eBay or on Amazon, non-machinable. What this tells the post office is I can't run this through a machine. The other thing you need to know, though, you put a forever stamp, you have to, and I should have pulled this out ahead of time. Let me pull it out for right now for you mm, back here, is that these stamps right here, they're rabbit stamps. Just say, I need rabbit stamps. I think they're like 10 cents or 12 cents, 13 cents, something like that. But basically, if you're going to send something through uh, the, the mail service with a stamp, but you don't want it to be machined, you got to do two things. You got to stamp it, non machinable, and you got to put one of these rabbit stamps. So it's a forever stamp and a rabbit stamp. That's sufficient postage to, uh, postage to get it there. So you're good with postage. And then you put this to notify them, don't put it through the machine. Then you're fine. This little. Um, uh, this little stamp here, all right, this thing uh, cost maybe 15, 20 bucks, okay? But over time, as you're using this and you're saving on postage by doing it this way instead of putting it in a package, it's going to pay for itself eventually. And then this is for items that say, like a matchbook that has matches in it. A lot of commercial airlines uh, also transport packages, uh, packages for the postal service. So, like, the next time you're on an airplane flight, there could be stuff being shipped in that same plane that you're on at the same time. And there are certain things that are potentially flammable that are not allowed to be on a commercial flight. So, if I'm going to be shipping a, um, a matchbook, I'm going to put that uh, additional postage, but I'm going to also put this sticker on it to tell them, hey, this can't go um, through uh, transportation. All right. And actually, you know what? Forget what I said about the stamps. I think you actually have to get a regular, um, you have to, you pay um, either through eBay, if you're selling on eBay or at the post office, get the, the correct postage. So get the correct postage, but put this on there. That way um, it uh, it doesn't go on the plane if it's not, if it's not in a category that it is allowed to do so. All right. For my larger items, I have an arsenal of these things at all times. By having the stuff I just showed you and this stuff at the warehouse at all times, it means that I don't have to waste time thinking, oh, I wonder what package I need to use for this. I wonder how hard it's going to be to package. I wonder how much it's going to weigh. I wonder how much it's going to cost. Folks, 99% of the things that I buy, before I have walked out of the store I bought it in, I already know within about a dollar how much it's going to cost me to ship regardless of where it goes in the country. <laughs> Why? Well, I've learned that from experience doing it. I buy things on eBay and I know the different package sizes and what they usually cost. But this is what I have. I'm showing you what I've already recommended. I have a U.S. Postal Service um, account. I have ordered things that came in for free and this is what I use. I have a priority bubble mailer. I have this foldable box here, which is, um, I wonder if it says, I can't remember if it says the dimensions, but this is something small you could put, uh, if you weren't sending it in media mail, something the size of a book or something a little bit larger than could fit in your pocket, but could still fit in this. And then this is my, one of my favorite boxes, actually. It's what they call a, a shoe box, right? A shoe box. And this is um, 14 and 7 eighths by 5 and a quarter by 7 and 3 eighths. Very strange size, but you can actually fit shoes. I've sold a variety of like nice Nike shoes and things like that in a box like this. It's priority mail um, and a variety of things can fit in here. It's a good adequate amount of space for a variety of different types of items. Then of course, I've got a couple of other standard boxes that cost very little. Six by six. I bought these at Walmart um, just because uh, I could. <laughs> Six by six by six. That's a good standard size. We've also got this one right here, which is 12 by eight by 10. A lot of the stuff we sell, most of the stuff we sell will fit in that. And then finally, 
we have poly bags. Sometimes if we sell clothing, different things that I'm not worried could get damaged, but um, I would rather use something lightweight or not have to fiddle with a big box. I can just drop them in this bag. It's self-adhering uh, and it works really well. Yes! Folks, when you're outsourcing, here's my advice. Be kind and respectful to the people. Chat them up. Frequent the same spots and get to know the people there. Don't be forceful. Don't be rude. Get to know people. And then if it makes sense, ask them questions. Ask them if they could give discounts. Ask them, is there anything I should know? Are you putting stuff out at a certain time? Are there discounts on certain days? Things like that. Uh, you will find that you will probably get ahead a lot better in this industry as a reseller if you are relational and you actually invest time in people. That's been my approach and it's worked out really well for me. Sure, I could come in heavy and strong and really bark and I could, you know, ask for the biggest discount in the world. You know what? It might come through for me on one item. You know what? The next time I come in, they're not going to want to see me. <laughs> and so, my approach has always been like treat people kindly if i'm going to be wanting to film something like don't don't put a camera in someone's face without asking them don't walk in and just assume that it's okay um there is there's kind of a a, a stench a little bit on the reseller community in some areas and it has everything to do with uh, certain strategies and tactics and behaviors of certain people who are buying and reselling. And that's unfortunate, and I hate it, <laughs> frankly, because uh, people like myself who are trying to, to just run a legitimate business and do so um, respectfully, um, we have a hard time because that negative connotation affects us as well. Yeah. I will say, though, always ask if someone could give a discount. Usually the way I approach it is, hey, I'm really interested in this item, and I think that the price is fair, but I just wonder if it's possible that this person would take a little bit less. If not, I understand, but it never hurts to ask, ha, 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 you know? And you will find that usually if you approach people kindly like that and you show respect, more often than not, people are willing to work with you. Now, I don't do that at places like Goodwill or Salvation Army that have set costs that the worker at the front check checkout is not authorized to negotiate with people. That's not a part of their business plan. And you know what? I'm not trying to rip them off either because, again, uh, I want to support my community. But if I'm out at like an antique store, something you may or may not know about antique stores is that a lot of times people who sell in those, in those booths, they tell the uh, establishment, hey, if someone ever asks for a discount, um, go ahead and just give them 10% off or give them 20% off. You don't have to call me every time, that kind of thing. And so, you, you know, you'll be surprised if you go up and ask, they'll say, hmm, oh, well, hold on, let me look. They'll open up a little book to see notes from certain vendors and they'll say, oh yeah, we can give you 15% off. <laughs> well, thanks so much, you know. Uh, sometimes though, they'll say, well, let me give them a ring and see if I can't get a hold of them. They'll call. Sometimes they answer while you're in the store and you get that discount or, or not. But it really doesn't hurt to ask as long as the way you're asking uh, is, is kind. Before you're going to become a full-time reseller, you need to understand your tax obligations. Where is your money going and how much is it going to cost you? To do this business, whenever I am deciding what to buy, I have to consider what I think I can actually sell for it, what the percentage is that eBay is going to take out by doing the, the work for you or pro providing their platform, 13.5%, 14%, something like that, and then what the taxes are going to be. So you really need to know that, and I would recommend, highly recommend that at a very minimum, you invest in some sort of accounting software program like QuickBooks or something. That's what I use, QuickBooks. Um, this is not a, a, a promotional thing for QuickBooks. It's just what I use, and it works. Um and it also syncs with bank accounts and with eBay. So um, when all those transactions are happening, it all goes into one spot. At a minimum, you should do that. But you might want to consider um, having an accountant or somebody like that to help you when it comes tax time so that you don't make any mistakes. Um, and also somebody, you know, it's best to get multiple eyes on it. But you want to have a plan. You want to know what things are going to cost. And you always need to do your research before you buy things. When I'm looking to decide whether or not I want to buy something, I always research first. 
The way I do that is on my phone, I usually look up first to see what has sold on eBay in the last 90 days. I'll also use Google Lens sometimes, which is the little uh, photo button on Google. You can click on that and it will try to search for that item if you take a picture of it and tell you what it is. And then sometimes you can find your way to um, platforms that sell that. And that will help you determine the value of it. Um, you want to look not only if it's sold at an auction or if it's sold by it now. You want to see how many bidders, how long that auction went for, how many of them have sold. All these things will help you to figure out, is it something worth getting? And also, how long did it take, you know, would, would you think it could take to sell this thing? A month? Three months? How much are you going to have to spend on it? It's not hard for me to pay a dollar for something and wait because that's a low investment. But if I'm going to spend a hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, I don't really want that uh, that item to sit out there for six months floating that money because I need that money. I could be using that money today to buy something else, multiple other things and sell them. So you're going to have to figure out what makes the most sense for you based on the money you have to spend. It's going to be floating for a while before it sells. When it sells, it's going to take a while for that money to get to you. And once it gets to you, it's going to take a while before you're outside of your return window so that you know you can spend that money um, as you see fit. <sighs> that was a lot, folks. That's a lot to digest. I hope that helps some of you out there. Folks, this industry can be really fun. You get to decide where you go and when, what money you spend. You can take time off when you want. You don't have to ask anyone. And there are perks to this job, folks, but you need to understand what the potential problem areas are first. Get those things taken care of so that you can enjoy the benefits that this type of work can afford you. Um, coming up next, we're going to have a video on YouTube, our experience and our journey of making a YouTube channel as full-time resellers. If you have any interest in that, I want to give you a very raw, real, honest, uh, you know, assessment of what I think that this world is like, um, what you can expect if you want to do it, unless you're in that, that crazy top percent of people who essentially win the lottery on YouTube. If you're a regular old person like me and you're going to do you know, some hard work, this is what you might be able to expect. We'll see you next time, folks. Good luck out there in your sourcing. Be -do -bo -bo -bo. Let's go make some money. Rusty, rusty, rusty hair.